Uh, right, uh, it's five past, so um, I will begin. Um, can we start by doing, there's some new people in the group. Uh, I know you guys, uh, you don't know me uh, necessarily, and everyone else doesn't either. So can we do quick introductions, uh, just where you're from and uh, who you are? I am Nick, I'm uh, representing the um, ODI here, um, and I'm uh, part of the open active team in the ODI. I also have another hat I wear, which is I'm in, but for this call and always in this call, I'm representing the ODI. Hi, uh, I'm David I'm Brown. In. Oh. After you. Okay, cool. Um, I'm Peter Dawkins from Clubspark. I'm solution architect over there. Uh, yeah, doing booking platforms for tennis and a couple of other sports across the world. So definitely interested in trying to standardize as much as possible. Hi, I'm David Brownlee from Trainers One. We produce a personal AI powered running coach and we're obviously very interested in root data and such like. I'm Ian Downs. I'm product owner at Legend. So we provide software to run hundreds and thousands, in fact, of clubs around the UK. And I have three more days of employment here before I hand over to Wayne, who will no doubt introduce himself next. Therefore, he's employed to time that. <laughs> yep, um, I'm Wayne. I work at Legend and I'm taking over from Ian as product owner. Wow. <laughs> no small task. Nope. <laughs> and this will probably go over my head for this session, most definitely. <laughs> no problem at all. Hi, uh, I'm Dennis uh, from Go Sweats, Berlin for Kent. Um, yeah, I, I work for Go Sweats, a uh, gym class marketplace. Uh, I'm Nathan, I work for Perfect Gym, uh, which is a Polish software company which is a cloud platform, uh, and I was formerly with MindBody for 16 years, so I've got quite a lot of background experience in online bookings and e-commerce. Uh, I'm Izzy Champion. I'm Data and Innovation Manager at Sport England, so I look after Open Active from Sport England's perspective. So everyone, have we had Phil yet? No, I was just waiting to see if everybody else had finished. Uh, hi, I'm Phil Davies. I'm the head of development at Gladstone Software. Um, I'm generally ultimately responsible for all the products that we produce at Gladstone. Um, I'm quite a high level, admittedly, but that's me and that's what I do. Great. Uh, two left, I think Dom and then one other caller that's just joined. We're doing introductions, caller that's just joined. Dom, are you there? Sorry, yeah, I was on mute, it was in a different screen. Um, I'm here, I'm from I'm in. We've got a, a few of the I'm in chaps listening in, so we're, um, we're very interested to hear how this goes. Perfect, excellent. And finally, unknown caller, uh, who are you? <laughs> or maybe your secret today. All right. If you... I think that was me. I uh, I led Pete from Clubswark. All oh, right, you're, you're there twice. Okay, no worries. Um, cool. Well, let's get let's get started and crack on then. So um, you've got, a, you've got an idea of who's on the call. Thank you so much for your time today and joining. Um, as uh, you're all at different stages of this, uh, don't feel silly about asking silly questions. They're probably not silly questions. I don't think there's such a thing at this stage. Um, so. Uh, please do feel free to just jump in and ask anything. Um, if it sounds like it's more complex and you feel like you're a little bit further behind, um, we can schedule a separate session off uh, apart from this to kind of get you up to speed. So let me know if you're interested in that. We can go through this one to one um, and and catch you up on the summary of the calls that you may have seen on YouTube uh, to save you watching the hours of footage. Um, I'll try and do you a trailer or something. Um, so uh, so yeah, that's that's open to everybody if that's something that would be useful. Um, the objective of today is to go through the um, specification. We're just going to go through it at the high level, um, touching on where it's at uh, across the different parts of it, and then highlighting some issues which we've um, flagged. They're actually issues in the spec. When you're reading through, you'll see them. Um, and to give people the opportunity to comment on those issues. Um, we're going to today, um, I know that there's um, some questions about scope which uh, have been 
um, discussed in, in here and in other places. Um, so I suggest today that we don't include those uh, in detailed discussion. So if anyone's got a comment on scope, so I don't think that should be there, or I think that something else that's missing should be there, please do raise that. Um, but I suggest today we don't go into the detail of that conversation. We'll just note those things and then we'll figure out how to proceed depending on what they are and, and, and whether we need a one-on-one -on -one, one run through to talk through why they're not in scope, for example. And if you still think you want to bring it into scope, then great. Let's bring that into the next call or, uh, for example, or um, if there's something that um, you're, is in scope and you think it shouldn't be there, then we can think about cost implementation when we look through the, um, the detail of it with the developers in the next few calls. Um, so hopefully everyone's seen the schedule that we sent out with the kind of list of what's, what's coming up um, on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen um, and I'm going to switch over to um, show you the spec and hopefully you'll see um, where we are at. Oh. Completely seamlessly. Right, you'll see that. Yeah, you can see yeah. the screen now. Perfect. Okay, great. So um, this is um, yeah, this is so this is a spec. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through. Apologies for those of you that are already aware of this uh, this detail, but I think maybe starting at the top will allow people to kind of get involved um, a bit more. Um, but we'll, we'll fly through uh, as well. So very quickly uh, to summarize the concept of what we're doing here, this specification is about allowing an order to be placed uh, within a booking system. A booking system in this diagram you can see there uh, is the system of record for bookings. Um, the idea is that the specification allows a broker, which is any third party, such as Trainers One on this call, um, to, uh, to book something within that booking system to place an order. Um, and the, there's an acknowledgement in the specification that the customer is interfacing with the broker. That's the end-end -end customer. There's also the acknowledgement that there's a seller who uses the booking system. So that's involved in that. And there's a payment provider who allows, facilitates the payment um, between these um, using uh, move credits or nectar points or monthly invoicing or whatever you want, loads of different ways of doing that. But for the purposes of this uh, specification, that those gray uh, arrows are out of scope and the focus of the specification is purely between the broker, which is that third party that's making the bookings and the booking system. So it's tightly, tightly down to those, uh, that, that interface between those two. Um, and so uh, the general user journey that we, we uh, were looking at here is one where you, at a high level, you select something that your customer wants, you, um, you then expect a registration of some sort, and then you expect booking and payment to occur. Um, sometimes you might already have a selection made in the app. Maybe it's Maybe there's AI involved. Maybe it's automatically doing that. Registration, there might already be someone logged in. So these steps don't necessarily need to be shown to the consumer. But in the background, there is a, an element of selection that's occurred somehow through some mechanism. There's an, a way of registering and identifying that user somehow, again, through some mechanism. They might be registered with their Alexa, you know who knows um, and there's booking and payment which um, again is um, we will will occur here paying payment will happen somehow again through some mechanism but the um, booking is the bit that this spec covers um, so that, that we jump in if anybody has um, got questions on that so I get through to the next diagram um, so this this is uh, the way that the spec works again high level uh, there is a uh, kind of three three steps here. You go in and you say, I want to select this thing, and then you register and then you, you book and pay. What, what happens is at every point um, in the journey, you, you interact with the booking system, but you do so in a, in a slightly different way each time. So when you select a thing, you uh, go to the booking system and say, I want to um, make that booking. And then when you when you when you do sorry when you you know say I want to make that booking you say I want I want to quote for what that booking would look like if I do make it so you so that's what the checkpoint one is so I want to know if I can make this and what it would look like and the response comes back at checkpoint one with the kind of the result of the basket so I want item one I want a, a Zumba class at seven o'clock the result comes back okay great that that Zumba class is going to have 
50p of tax on it, it's going to be this total um, and it's available. It's the idea. So checkpoint one is, is the anonymous version of that. Checkpoint two is exactly the same. You say, I want to book that Zumba class. It comes back and says, yes, it's available. Here's the tax. Additionally, in checkpoint two, it also allows you to pass in uh, details of the person that's wanting to make the booking. Um, and the reason that's useful is because at checkpoint one and checkpoint two, the booking system can optionally reserve a slot. Uh, it's called a lease. Um, while this is happening, so that the thing doesn't get nicked from their shopping basket by some other user when they're getting to the end of their journey. Um, so that's really the purpose of these two. It's optional leasing, but everyone makes those call. Every broker will make those two calls to say, you know, what's the bar what's the shopping basket look like effectively? What's the total and the taxes involved? And then um, again, when you've got more information about the user. And both times, uh, the booking system has an opportunity to make a lease optionally, doesn't have to do that. And then finally, uh, the booking is made. So the, uh, the broker will, will instruct the payment provider to authorize a payment, which is a temporary, again, effectively another lease on the payment itself, and then confirm the booking with the booking system. And then we, we capture the payment, that last step, uh, which is effectively confirming the authorization, capturing the payment. If there's a failure that happens before that, the authorization automatically gets removed by the payment provider anyway. Um, and, uh, and so the, the payment is never captured. Um, so that's, that's the quick overview in five minutes of what's going on. Does that all make sense to everybody? Can't see any, any ca cameras, so it's hard to tell about nodding. Good, okay. Um, so that's what's going on. And then, uh, so just to the next diagram, slightly more detail around that. Um, and I will highlight during this little bit here, some of the changes that have been made since the last call. Um, so uh, the way this works is, um, and thank you Ian for your, um, your interim feedback. I know that you've, your contributions to this diagram uh, and other places, um, very, very valuable indeed. So um, when we said that first checkpoint, that's C1 we're calling it. So C1, that first checkpoint of I'm going to see if my, what my shopping basket looks like anonymously. That's a put with an object with what's called an order quote that includes some information. A, a UUID, um, which is a, a kind of universal identifier, which is generated um, by the booking system is used for that call and used consistently through all the calls, which is how the broker, the, sorry, uh, generated by the broker. And that's how the booking system knows um, that this is talking about the same thing. So the broker creates a UUID and then uses it and reuses it until the point where it completes. Um, so broker takes the UUID, takes the shopping basket, constructs the order quote, gives it to the booking system, booking system comes back with the total uh, and the availability. Same thing happens in two, um, but this time, again, with, with the user details, if that's available, you send that through and then you get back, again, the, uh, the availability and the total payment. Um, then, the, as we just mentioned before, the broker will authorize the payment with the payment provider and then make that final put call of the order, which is a full order now, uh, to say uh, it's, it's exactly the same as the order quote call. It's just called an order instead and say, I want to do what you just told me I can do. I want to confirm that now. And here's the user details. You also, at this point, pass in the payment identifier that you will have got through authorization so that you can link the payment together just for audit. So the booking system at least has that information about what the payment, what the payment is. Um, and then what that does is that, that confirms that with the booking system. And then this is a slight change that's happened. Uh, the result comes, comes back from the booking system. That's, that's, that, if that's confirmed, you move to capturing the payment, again with the payment provider. And the final step here, is invoice generation uh, and customer notification. So that the broker does that. Um, so they generate the invoices and they notify the customer that that booking is successful. Um, in the previous version, this was actually the RPDE feed that did that. Um, but because um, it's likely, as was pointed out in the feedback, that we probably want to be able to link other metadata about the user or the transaction, some, some other stuff that the broker might have been doing other than just the order, you probably want to be able to save down 
the result of this um, this call, this order, um, and at that point say that's the order. So in this version now, what happens is that the broker gets the result of the order um, call and stores that themselves as the final order to say that's that's the order and notifies people from that. So they, they don't wait for for anything else to happen. Um, and then what happens ne later on is that if there's any cancellations or anything changes, there's a feed called an RPDE feed, um, which which the broker is um, is effectively synchronized with. And if any cancellations happen, the booking system just puts the, the updated order on the feed and the broker picks that order up and then deals with the cancellation, deals with the refund, whatever needs to be done from that, which we'll, we'll come on to talk about in detail about cancellations and refunds. Nick, um, could I just ask what the um, intent of the green capture payment line is? That will be it. This one. Uh, so the payment uh, authorize and capture are the two steps of um, of making a two step payment. Um, so uh, the the authorize step is saying to the credit card company, uh, we would like to authorize. It happens when you book a hotel room generally. I would like to authorize eighty pounds, or I'd like to authorize seven pounds on the card, um, as it, just just to, to lock that amount down, so it can't be spent by anybody else. So if you've only got seven pounds of your credit card's credit limit left, that will that will take that away. So you can't use your credit card for anything else. Um, so that's locked down and guaranteed. And the capture payment is actually when the funds get transferred. So you authorize first to lock that money down in the credit card. And then when you capture it, that's confirming the transaction. What's um, the reason for telling the booking system? Oh, you don't tell the booking system in this case here. Um, so the um, so the booking and payment, so first of all, the, sorry, it's hard to see because you can't see the top of it, isn't it? There we go. Um, so, uh, yeah, there we go. So it, you hear the broker, first of all, calls the payment processor to authorize, and then the broker um, commits that order to the booking system with the payment identifier. And then at that point, the booking system, as far as the booking system is concerned, at that point, the deal's done. It's, it's been completed. Um, and then, my, apologies, my apologies, the capture payment doesn't go to the booking system, it goes direct to the payment system. Forgive me. Yes, it's my, question. it's my fault for uh, having the diagram uh, not, not all shown at once on the page. Um, that's, so does that make sense to, to everybody broadly? Anybody got any questions on that or thoughts on that, that, that change I mentioned? All looks good. Yeah, makes sense. Super. Um, okay. Um, so, carrying on then uh, through to a few other the other minor changes that have been made. Um, so, ah, sorry. Before we do that, it's quick explanation again. Uh, quick catch up for people. Um, customer. Uh, reseller and seller there's a few there's a few um um where's the diagram maybe that is the diagram so there's a there's a few different ways that broker um can be um represented in the, in the transaction flow um and they are reseller broker and agent broker so the difference between the reseller broker and the agent broker is it's a different contractual relationship between the customer and the seller so just quickly, what that means is um, a reseller broker owns the inventory. So it's a bit like if you have if you have theatre tickets. If someone books a coachload of people into seats in the theatre, they'll they'll buy all those seats and then they'll sell the tickets to the coach tour and sell them one by one. But the key thing is that the reseller has bought the, seat, the seats in advance, and that's what the reseller broker model is. P um, uh, pays you, Jim, and, and some others do this. Um, and so in that case, you would buy from the seller, that's one transaction, and then separately you would, uh, the, you would then resell those seats or resell the, um, the, the pass, the day pass or whatever it is. Um, again, the focus of this is about the immediate, um, trans, uh, the, the immediate um, interface with the order. And so that is between the reseller broker and the seller. And that's what we would, we would focus on in terms of this spec. And so what that means is that this spec covers um, the reseller broker purchasing from the seller 
and then however the customer wants to purchase from the reseller broker is then up, up to them. And then the other way of doing that is slightly different where you've got a customer and a seller and what's called an agent broker. And this is more common in situations where you want to purchase a pay-as-you-go class, primarily for tax reasons. Um, so there's, an, there's a tax exemption in the UK, uh, which a lot of the leisure trusts um, uh, are covered by, which basically means that the customer can uh, purchase from the seller if the seller is uh, selling certain leisure activities uh, without any tax. Uh, there's no VAT. And so that, that only applies in this scenario. It doesn't apply in the previous reseller scenario. And for that to happen, the contractual relationship has to between, be between the customer and the seller. And in that case, all the agent broker is doing is, is really allowing that to happen. It's, it's brokering it. It's a bit like eBay. If you see, you know, the, um, you're buying something from another known seller on there, um, but maybe not as obvious as eBay is as a marketplace. But what that means is as a, as a broker, in the agent broker world, you need to be really clear that you're not selling your own stuff. So if you're, if you're a broker, um, picking on trainers one, for example, if you're selling uh, some, an activity, you can't be branding it trainers one's activity, you have to brand it as uh, Fusions or whoever the actual seller is and make that really clear that's who you're purchasing from within the interface, within the experience. And so that, that therefore customers qualify a tax exemption. And then if you want to do things like taking a cut of, uh, you know, the fees or whatever commercials you want around that in terms of the um, uh, um, commercial relationships between the different parties, that can be done. It's just out of scope of this. So if you want to charge a transaction fee like Stripe does, you just do that um, out of band and settle that however you want to settle it between the broker and the seller or between the customer and the broker. And there's loads of ways of doing that. Um, does that make sense to, sorry, that was a very quick um, answer. Does that make sense to people who have just seen this roughly? Yep. Yeah, that's good. Okay, uh, super. So, and then you can also, obviously you can have a no broker situation where a customer just buys from seller and there's no broker in there. This API can be used for that purpose, although it's not its primary purpose. That's, it's designed with that in mind. Um, so, um, and so now you understand the roles that the broker plays, hopefully this becomes a bit clearer. Um, and that's, this is the separation of um, the different concerns of, of who looks after what. So the booking system is purely concerned with orders. That's what the booking system is concerned with. And the payment provider is concerned with payments and refunds. The broker is the only, is the only um, actor in this that has visibility of everything. And additionally to that, there's a system of record for the invoices. And that's important because the invoice is a legal document. You need to maintain versions of the invoice every time you change it. Um, and so rather than overcomplicating the booking system side, that decision was made a few um, weeks ago to move that into uh, the broker so that it would be simpler um, for everybody else. And also more flexible for the broker in their models. So they might want to do monthly invoicing or, or daily or just a receipt for a pay as you go or whatever they want to do. And also with the invoice that's generated, they might want to use different currencies like move credits or nectar points or whatever else, um, or employee wellness vouchers. And so because the invoice is likely to involve a lot more than you want to put into the booking system, the idea is that the invoice is generated at the point where that diversity exists, which is the broker. And um, it's the broker's responsibility therefore to maintain that legal document, which then explains what we'll come on to talking about feeds um, because the invoices exist in the broker, if there's any changes to the order, then you've got to keep up to date with the what's called the orders feed of the booking system as a broker in order to make sure you get those changes um, coming through. And so, uh, does that make sense in terms of separation of responsibilities? Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay, um, please do, do shout if not. Um, and so um, one of the other things that's been added around, around uh, this since last time we uh, spoke is tax, the tax mode made that slightly clearer. Um, the tax mode, which is net or gross, this is a US thing more than anything. Um, in the US, as you can see from this table, uh, prices are generally displayed net, which means they're displayed without any VAT. If you're in a supermarket or wherever um, and then the VAT is added 
at the point of checkout. In other countries, Australia, uh, some parts of Europe and in the UK, um, we see prices inclusive of VAT, mainly because our VAT is much simpler. It's 20% every, everywhere, whereas it's not, it changes state by state in the US and it, it's more complicated. And so um, there are two different modes, that's tax net and tax gross. And it, this is, is saying now is in order to comply with the booking spec, you need to state which mode you're using and do that at the seller level. And it seems to be common across a lot of systems that it's at the seller level that this is a distinction that's made. You can't have some items in your, in your if you're a, a leisure operator, you can't sell some stuff net and some stuff gross because it will it'll blow your accountant's mind um, with that complexity. So generally speaking, you pick one as a company and you stick to it uniformly. Someone's about to comment? Or just take, just come off mute. Okay. Uh, no. Okay. So that um, that's what that's about. And the idea is it's at the seller level. Um, so that it could be that booking systems support both and allow sellers, if they're an international organisation, to pick whichever one suits them best. Um, so if that's all good. Um, so right now, perfect. So with half an hour left, we can get into the, the meat of these uh, these issues. So does everything so far make sense to everybody? And then we can we can start talking about issues. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All good for me. Okay. Great. So um, first issue here is uh, a question of scope. So I won't labour the discussion. Uh, in would we'll suggest we label the discussion here as we discussed before. Um, but I'm flagging it so that you guys can think about whether you want to comment on this issue. And to comment on this issue, just click on the issue. Uh, you'll be in GitHub. You can then just add a comment to that issue. Um, like, like so. If I open that in a new tab, you'll see that GitHub issue is linked. Uh, and there's already a comment. I believe I've, I've pasted Ian's comment in here from Legend. Um, so you can read that. Um, so, so this is a question about um, uh, price overrides. So the purpose of price overrides this booking spec, because as we mentioned, puts most of the onus of the diversity of the different types of payments, et cetera, onto the broker to really allow for that full scope of innovation. Um, the only thing that's not possible, the only business model that's not possible using the spec as it stands without this section is um, price variabilization. And that's the case of, for, for example, if you, um, you might have a, a situation where you want to agree certain prices uh, to resell certain um, um, certain items, so you might say that, for example, through a particular broker, it is the case that all Zumba classes are five pounds if they're from GLL, right? Um, for some reason, you've agreed that with GLL, and GLL is happy with it. Maybe it's part of a national campaign. Maybe it's like a weekend crazy sale, whatever that is. And so you just want to blanket all all Zumba classes to be five pounds, and it will come out in the wash if they're more or less. Um, this is what that enables you to do. So you, as you, a broker, you override the price um, of the offer um, and, and that allows you as a, as a broker to say uh, it's five pounds. And then um, uh, the, bro the booking system has to honor that. And uh, the idea here is that it's, there's nothing in here to, uh, around constraining that functionality at the moment on the basis that, and this is one of the principles I think of the, of the spec at the moment, that, the, the commercial relationship between the broker and the seller is what's going to govern what people do and don't do. This spec provides all the facilities, but the commercial relationship is what lets people know what they can do. So for example, if someone signs a deal with GLL for those Zumba classes, and they start also offering yoga classes or some other class for five pounds, and it's not within the deal that they've agreed, they will be able to do it within the system. There's nothing to stop them doing that. Of course, their contract probably won't last very long. Um, because they'll have gone against that contract and they could well be out in the cold um, and, and lose that, um, that contract. And so obviously, as with every commercial relationship, you want to honor your commercial contracts so, and continue to build trust and do business that way. And so in this case, uh, and one of the principles of this is, we won't put the complexity in the spec of, of fine-grained access controls and trying to you know, get into the detail of all of that stuff. We, we make that available here and we, we allow people to trust people to work with people that they want to work with and, and that those, you know, those contracts are honored. 
um, and you know however, however they want to to do that and they'll be able to no doubt get reports out of booking systems uh, anyway in, in terms of revenue and things to, to show whether these things are actually being honored um, and to do that, that checking but um, so yeah so that's that that's that um, hopefully that makes sense as a thing it's good because that covered some of the principles as well but as I said maybe if you've got any thoughts on that please do com go and comment on that issue that would be really really useful um, Oh, gonna, someone going to say something? Okay. Um, Sorry, I was just going to say, yeah. by virtue of being a broker, is the offer override functionality enabled? Uh, the, well, the su suggestion in the spec is that yes, it's always enabled, um, but you might not have an agreement with the particular organization you're working with to use it. So there's not a, even a course level, I don't want anyone to have this at all setting at this point. I should probably go and poke at the... GitHub. No, but you're right. That's that's something that's not in there. Uh, so Ian's suggestion is that there, there maybe there should be something like that so that you can just not enable it or or turn it off. Um, but but you know thought that's it. Thoughts welcome. Please do uh, do contribute on that. That point. Um, okay. Thanks. No worries. Okay. Great. So uh, so that's that. And then um, something else that's that's uh, that that I just wanted to clarify that's just new in since the last version is these bullet points on bookability. And so basically they're saying that in the open feeds, which are available and, and many of you will already be involved with um, either using or uh, publishing that data, um, there's uh, a number of things that make a session bookable. And so uh, things like if the available channel is equal to, it has, has got the value open um, booking payment. So that's something that you set at the event level. Uh, if the end date is not in the past, and that is that the, uh, so, so that allows you to book something even after it started, but that seems, well, it, it seems reasonable to do that. But again, after, after I go through the bullet points, any, any thoughts do you shout on that? Um, it seems to be any reason not to allow someone to do it late, just in case they're doing it as they're going through the turnstiles and they're slightly late to their own class. I don't know. Um, so the event status can't be cancelled or postponed. Um, there, ha there must be enough capacity, neither remaining attendee capacity or remaining uses. Um, so there must be enough spaces, basically. Um, the potential action, uh, which basically means the potential action of the data set site includes the open booking action, basically means that the open booking API is enabled, so you wouldn't be able to make a booking otherwise. There's this thing called valid, before, uh, valid from before start date, which basically means there's a book head window. It's one of the things that came out of the Legend workshop um, with, with their customers. Um, but you can, you can specify a global window, which is going to affect all brokers, which is a, a window um, uh, within which you can book before an activity starts. So, for example, you can only book a squash court seven days in advance. You can't book it eight days in advance. And that's a blanket. All brokers have to um, abide by that rule. Um, is, that, is the idea of that. Uh, and then, as we've mentioned, the tax mode has to be specified. So you must have you must choose tax gross or tax net. Um, does that seem as a, like a reason? Oh, there's one more here. Um, it needs, you need to have permission to access the booking system. So don't, don't hack it, basically. You need to have been given permission by the booking system to access uh, as a broker. So that's, the, that's the bullet points. Do they seem like a reasonable set of constraints? Um, does anyone have any, any thoughts to the contrary or otherwise? I think I think it's quite hard to um, answer that question on the spur of the moment because that's a very complicated set of criteria. But I'm sure we'll all, well, most of us, will have a look at it. Um, and against the uh, the RDP spec, um, the opportunity spec, and, and work out if that fits for us. Brilliant. Okay, that's great. Yes, um, and that's a fair point. Complicated. Um, mm -hmm. Just a quick question. So, the I mean, they sound like reasonable constraints to me. The question is, are there? What's the system that's enforcing them, or is this just a guidelines? Uh, this is uh, the system would enforce them. So the um, broke the booking system should. Uh, I think it's. I think it's in here uh, at the bottom of this. Uh, the booking system will reject any anything that doesn't that isn't bookable with an error. It's not bookable. So then enforce them. So it's something that we could expect of a booking system to be able to 
uh, have in return? And would there be specific error codes around this to denote that this rejected? Uh, yeah, that's right. There should be a not bookable, um, I believe it's uh, in the errors, error code section, uh, a not bookable error. Uh, and uh, the idea here is that if both sides, if both book brokers and booking systems are aware of this criteria and are both implementing the same criteria, you shouldn't be in a situation where a user is trying to book something that's not bookable because they won't have been given the book button in the first place. Cool, that makes sense. Cool, great. Yeah, the reason it's not as simple as just a bookable is true flag is as you probably noticed, these, these things here are all in different parts of the feed. So the idea is that because these things change over time, things like uh, capacity and status and end date, um, because they change over time, it means that you can, you can look at a feed and without needing to update everything in the feed when it becomes bookable or not bookable, you can um, figure out whether you should expect to make it, um, make it bookable, um, which just reduces the amount of overall traffic in the whole system because otherwise we'd be updating stuff all over the place as things become bookable and not bookable. But again, there's, there, there might be an argument that we should just have a bookable is true flag and then uh, make the feeds busy. Um, but I suppose we can't even do that because the remaining attendee capacity depends on what you're trying to book. So I suppose we'd really only be boiling down a few of these. Anyway, yes, thoughts if you um, have them, be very, um, very good to hear on that, those topics. So, um, applicable off. Sorry, sorry Nick, um, yeah. I, I think what you're saying there is that you want to avoid having to um, update the feed frequently uh, based on whether somebody can be booked or not. But every time someone books onto the activity, you potentially have to update the feed. I mean, obviously, it depends on the frequency of sucking through the RDPE. Yeah. Um, uh, so all you're really adding to that is uh, any changes to the feed that relate to value from before start, tax book, which is just not going to happen ever. So I'm just wondering whether that your is bookable um, as part of the feed actually makes more sense. It would be easy to implement all of this. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. So we, we might be able to take things like um, available channel status uh, and end date potentially yeah well i suppose i suppose maybe the, maybe one one thing to say is at the moment there's nothing in the feed that requires updating as time passes on its own the things in the feed only change if something gets booked as you say um so to, to have something like end date um encoded as a boolean you would need to have some kind of um that's a fair point that's a fair point yeah Okay. Well, yeah. But yeah. Good. Uh, good discussion. Um, and yeah. Okay. So, any more thoughts on that? Um, definitely. Uh, very. Very welcome. Um, so, uh, applicable offers. Uh, yeah. So the offers are are um, you basically use use inheritance in the model with applicable offers. This is another new uh, section. Um, basically, saying that there's a um, there is a, a tree of uh, for those of you who are slightly newer to the spec, um, let me just quickly give you a, a show you this in JSON form. There's a hierarchy of um, uh, events. Uh, where are we on this one? There's a hierarchy of, uh, of uh, events, and basically, um, what that means is that within uh, an event, let me just try and make this really simple, um, which is going to be. There we go. So um, to go with me on this slightly, within the object, if you're not familiar with this yet, which is describing the event, there are sub-events. And you can specify the offer at the sub-event level or in its parent. And what this section is talking about is that if you specify the offer at the sub-event level, as Clubspark does in the, um, in the feed for um, uh, athletics and the BLTA, you specify the, the, the sub-event level offer, then that is overriding anything that's specified at the parent level. So it's kind of classic inheritance, if you like. And um, the rules for parsing that are in these steps here. It's basically saying at the start of the start of the um, at where you are in the in the in the tree. So whatever thing you're trying to book, if that's the scheduled session, start there and then work your way up. Um, only accepting new offers if you haven't got something that conflicts with what you've already got. 
So you kind of look at the parent, okay, there's a new offer, include that. That we've already got that one, don't include that. Um, and the idea here is to use the identifier property um, to identify if there's the same offer being overridden. So if you're trying to override the adult price from junior to sorry, sorry the adult price from five pounds to three pounds for a particular event from the parent, then the identifier is what tells you that's the adult price and that therefore it's an override rather than a new price that's available. And can you use that to effectively remove a price from the offer set? Uh, no, it's a good point. You can't do that. If you wanted to rem remove a price, you would have to, uh, you could, you could um, remove it by making it member only. You could add the member, member only flag, um, but you would have to just not include it in the parent to remove one. Could you override the remaining capacity or something of that nature? Uh, you can override, yeah. Well, the, the rule is that any property can be overridden. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's um, but within the, within the scope of this spec, the focus is around the, um, uh, the offer. So, not, so this is probably not quite right because the offer itself is here. So let me show you, this is the parent level, this is the child level. So what it would look like is, is this. So that makes sense. So you've got you've got an offer which is you've got the offer at the scheduled session level, you've got the offer at the parent level, and in this case they're the same. The identifier is OXAD. And so in the case where this one was two pounds, this is over this is the parent, and then this is overriding it as the child. Two AD. Okay. I don't know if it makes sense, but I've been in other situations where everything is the same apart from this one that needs to not have some stuff. So Mm. might be worth deferring for another good okay i'll note that yeah so uh, there's a thing that we might want to um to disable or something an offer in that in that hierarchy okay yeah that's a good point i'll add that to the list so um great and then we're into cancellation so um and that covers it's going to cover our last few issues does anyone have any quick quick points before Moving on, it's all making sense so far. So, so apologies, a bit of a mix of, of kind of trying to fly through everything quickly and uh, uh, yeah, getting into detail. Uh, okay, so cancellation. Uh, one of the things that uh, is an issue here is that arbitrary refunds are not in scope. Um, I know this is a participant who aren't on this call, but on the previous call, this is an issue that uh, I think they would they cared about in terms of in their system, you can basically choose how much of a particular item to refund. You can say, I've got a five pound squash court, I'm only going to refund you two pound fifty for some reason. Um, the current specification does not allow you to do anything except a full refund. So the choice is either you refund the whole thing or you don't refund it. Um, but again, if anyone has any, this is a scope question. If anyone has any views on that you do want arbitrary refunds to be included in scope at this stage, and that's important as a kind of make or break for whether this works as a V1, I think the general view here is if we can make all this work without it and it's not a showstopper, then probably best keep it out. But if, there's a, if it is a showstopper, then that's the issue. Please do comment on that issue. Um, I know Club Spark uses that functionality currently, but. Interesting. Is it a showstopper? That's a that's a question for people higher up than me. <laughs> we shall uh, we shall uh, endeavour to we should endeavour to, to get the answer to that in the in the coming two weeks. Uh, that would be that would be really useful. Um, so yes, if you are able to find that out from somebody and and, and just comment on that issue, that would be incredibly useful, uh, Pete. <laughs> Yep, no worries. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, so cancellations then, as we um, blast through the final bits of this. Um, so cancellations, uh, this is effectively, we talked about there's a, there's a feed, um, and in that feed, there are items um, that, that, that may have already been booked, or will have already been booked, um, and there's two ways you can cancel something. Um, the cancellation can either come from the seller or from the customer. So the venue's flooded, the seller cancels. The customer's feeling ill, the customer cancels. Um, 
so with the, the customer cancellation scenario, obviously the customer's got to request that and the customer uses the broker to request that. So in that case, what happens is the broker looks at the, is, is always keeping an up-to-date view on the orders from the speed. So they'll have, a, they'll have an awareness of the order because it will have been stored when they made the booking. So the broker will know about the order and um, the order item in there that they do is they send a patch in to say, I want to cancel this, customer cancel. If they get a success back, that means that the cancellation has been processed. They don't do anything else, they wait. And then on the feed will arrive from the booking system, that cancellation confirmation. So they say, canceled, done. And then you send, it, send little notes to the user saying your cancellation is being processed. Later on, a minute later or five minutes later, the feed comes back with customer canceled. Uh, at that point, the broker receives that uh, prompt, generates the new invoice accordingly, generates refunds, you can see there. Um, and proceeds with notifying the customer, your refund was successful. Um, just on that, cancellations and refunds are separate for us. So a, a customer might cancel, but if they're outside of a designated cancellation window, they won't get a refund. So. Yep, that makes sense. So there is a, a property uh, in here, um, and I don't want to lose my place. I'm going to open a new tab, which is a cancellation window property. And so that is, again, a global, currently a global property you can set, which is whether you can cancel, uh, let me try and find it, whether you're able to cancel latest cancellation before start date. It was actually just below the same rather, diagram. Yeah, rather than do that, should the response from, so I saw in the diagram just above that you had um, the assumption basically that if the cancellation was successful then a refund is processed. Is it perhaps more useful to have a different status at that point? Because I mean, yeah, totally. uh, cancellation windows are only one, one kind of constraint that may be applied. There could be other reasons that a refund is or isn't eligible. So it may be that that response we send back um, you know, has something like refund eligible or something on it. Perfect. Yeah. So we'll add additional error codes around the cancellation so that you can basically come back with an error code saying you can't cancel, sorry, with an appropriate a text uh, text. Yeah, I, Nick, hi Nick, it's Ian here. Um, I really had the impression that the cancellation window was part of the information that came back about the event in the order quote. Um, I may be thinking of our booking API rather than the ODI one. So No, that's right. It is. Uh, okay, so it's, it's, it's uh, is it or is it not in the in the feed effectively? It is the cancellation last latest cancellation or start date is in the offer, which means it's both yeah. in the open feed and in okay. as you say in the. So I think to reply to um, the, the, the the previous uh, whoever was speaking, sorry, I didn't catch the name. Um, that the the idea here is that this is the last point at which you cancel. So. Before that, you get the refund, and that will be a refund of the whole amount. After that, you get nothing. Um, so, oh, in fact, you can't cancel. So that's the least common denominator. I think one of the challenges with the booking uh, API that we're trying to develop is to get to a least common denominator, because if we try and capture all the complexities, it will ever, 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 ever be finished. Mm. And all those evers were for a good reason. <laughs> we're doing this a year now, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think that you know, if, if you can support having the option of, and you can say what the cancellation period is. So when you say, yes, here's the offer, you can cancel up to two hours beforehand and we'll give you your money back. After that you can't cancel, well, that's a simple case. Perhaps in your real system, people still cancel, but don't get the refund. Um, but if you kind of provide that window, it gives a slightly less useful functionality, but you're trying to talk to different audience here to the, 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 the man in the street as opposed to your members. Absolutely, yes, it's, it's the man in the street scenario, isn't it? So is what you're saying there that we should keep this uh, high level or are you saying we shouldn't because it's too complicated even to have this? No, I think we should have that there because it provides enough functionality to control for the, um, the platform to control how cancellation can be managed in, in the sense of before this time, you can cancel, you get your money back, after this time, you can't. And that's the, the simplest way of allowing cancellation with refunds. Yeah? Anything more than that, I think we all have different ways of doing it, so we need to capture that as a 1.1. Um, yep. if, we if we can work with this, that would be easiest to implement. 
So I'd actually, I'd contest that and say that the easiest way to implement it and actually support everyone would just be for that cancellation to say whether they're eligible for a refund or not. You know, we can revise partial refunds and that later, but there, there's many more scenarios than just you're inside a, a refund window as to whether someone is eligible for a refund. And I, I don't think the two should be coupled. I, I understand, you know, I, I feel like this implementation here, we're kind of promoting one particular scenario to be a first class citizen and ignoring everything else, where in actual fact, that one scenario is just, it, it's minor really, it's... Um, so this is, uh, this, is, this is a great discussion guys. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that as a GitHub issue, table it and send it round. Yep. Um, you guys could just feed in that, that would be amazing. Um, yep. Um, great, thank you. And I, I guess waiting for Ian. <laughs> it doesn't happen in the next however many hours you've got left Ian. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's really helpful. Thank you. Okay, so swiftly moving through this. Sorry to um, to uh, expedite the uh, conversation. Um, I can see both sides of that. Um, allowing whole order cancellation. I think we just talked about this. There's a question about. Um, uh, oh no, we sorry, we haven't talked about this yet. This is a very simple question. It's there's currently no call you can make that cancels the entire order. Uh, for reasons of simplification, if you want to cancel an entire order you have to make repeated calls to this patch to cancel each item in the order. And if you make, if you cancel every item, then the order is effectively canceled. But the order itself doesn't have a cancellation status, doesn't really exist. The items have status of either they're confirmed or they're canceled. But the order itself is a, just a shell, it's an empty shell. It doesn't have its own life. It just exists to hold its, the things within it. And, and simplifying that out so it doesn't have its own status um, is one of the things that's, that's happened here. Um, but if there's any reason for, again, I'll, I'll just sign to that issue um, and the contribution very welcome on that. If there's any reason that you can see why you want to be able to cancel the whole order um, without making those individual calls, um, which obviously has some complexity in terms of implementation for the booking system, but we might argue for some reason that that is, is better. Um, and, uh, and so I guess that's, that's there for. That. If you don't allow full order cancellation, then everyone needs to support partial order cancellation when they wanted to refund everything. So if you want to refund everything, you've got four tickets to refund two of them, you now get an error back. Everyone now needs to deal with that state. Uh, yes, because you've only cancelled two and you wanted to cancel four for some reason. Yes, so whether or not you can, even if you could say, here's a list of tickets that I want to cancel, they all yeah. have to be on the same order. You can say yay or nay. That allows it with hopefully without adding too much additional complexity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Good point. So you want to maybe make that, yeah, it just adds slightly complexity to the patch. So there's, there's an argument that actually that, that patch should actually be a patch to the, um, to the order rather than a patch to the order item. And then you can uh, include what you want to cancel as one go uh, and do that then and, and maybe we simplify it that way yeah i'd agree that with that a lot of sense. okay so order patch that seems like a broad consensus uh okay i will i will accept take that as a motion to change that to that uh if no one else has any comments on it but if you do then please do comment on that issue i can see the logic in that as well makes sense Okay, so that's that. And then moving swiftly through, um, there's something in here we have uh, around natural batching. So what this is saying is, if you make a number of changes to an order, uh, then those order, those summarizing this whole thing, those changes don't come through to the feed for about 30 seconds or whatever the, yeah, I think it says 30 seconds, 30 second delay. Um, and that, that exists for two reasons. One is, is if we were to do multiple cancellations, which it sounds like we might actually switch, so we're not having that anymore. The other thing is that there's a race condition here. If you make an order, um, then, and, you, and then the booking system immediately cancels it, then there's a race condition because the order that's just been created might not yet have been stored by the broker, and it might appear in the feed by the, by the booking system canceling it in the cancellation feed, before the brokers had a chance to store it, which is a bit of a weird state to be in. So there's a there's a purpose 30 second purposeful 30 second delay here to remove that um, because it, it, it won't take more than 30 seconds for well it shouldn't take more than 30 seconds for the broker to can finish processing and store that state, and then that allows us to have the feed asynchronously updating from the uh, main booking being made. 
Um, is that only for the orders feed, or is that across the whole ODI um, surface area? That's just the orders feed. Uh, everything else would be updated uh, straight away. Okay. Uh, okay. Forgive me, but um, I'm backed into a pumpkin. You are. I knew, I knew this was coming. Um, uh, sorry, we have hit our time box. Thank you, everybody, uh, for, for your contribution so far. I'll, um, I'll flag um, that there are a couple more issues in here, um, and uh, um, I, I, I'm just quickly pointing them out. Um, there's one around, at the moment, the um, orders feed uh, doesn't include detail of the actual um, underlying logistics. So if there's a change of the start time of an event, currently the order feed isn't updated, the responsibility is on the, the broker to read the actual live open feed and get those changes and relay them on, um, which reduces some complexity from the broker, from the, from the booking system. Um, so that's an issue. I uh, would love your thoughts on it. Um, maybe wait, Ian should wave his hand quickly if he does disagrees, because then we know he disagrees. <laughs> you might never have time to comment on the issue. Absolutely no way I'm going to be able to read it. And I must go, so forgive me. Um, I will look and try and get a chance to come to you if I can, but I've got to get up now. Thank you so much, Ian, for all your contributions. Really appreciate that. Um, and, uh, and thank you, everybody else, as well. So um, that's, it, that's it. There's a couple of minor points in terms of service um, and uh, availability endpoint removal. But they, they are they're less important, and we, we have got uh, the detail in the spec. So please do read through. Um, and uh, the next step for this, that everybody knows, um, is uh, to have some, as you've probably seen in the email, um, we're looking for developers to start to design what it would look like in their systems to implement against this spec. And that's really important because it means you'll come face to face with some of the challenges that's involved in doing that. And so um, we'd love, if you're interested in that, just to ping us an email, reply to the email that I sent around, say you're keen so that we know who's doing what. Um, and the next call will be in two weeks time and we'll be doing a bit like what we've just done, but specifically focusing on implementation and any developers who are keen to implement. Um, can get involved and, uh, and raise any questions that they've, they've got. Um, and uh, we can also deal with any, any other small feedback. The idea is we're in finalization, so making small changes like we did to the patch, that's what we're expecting to be doing here. Um, and as we move through, we should see that we, we start getting to the point of, of consensus around the whole thing and everyone agreeing on it. Um, so thank you everybody uh, for putting up with the expedited nature of the call. And um, yeah, hopefully see you guys in, in a couple of weeks. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very guys. much. Bye. Bye.